We're joined by Horatio Falcao, affiliate professor of uh, decision sciences here at uh, INSEAD. We're talking about um, cross-cultural negotiations. Now, within, within that sort of sphere, there must, there must be a great deal of room for misunderstanding. Absolutely, absolutely, Stuart. Um, the, the element of cross-cultural negotiation is, is a concern of every negotiation, negotiator who negotiates internationally, right? And it's a question that comes very often, especially in a place like INSEAD, where we deal so much with the international aspect of negotiations. Uh, and two of the main misconceptions that I find, as you, as you just put forward, on, on cross-cultural negotiations is that, if I were to summarize in a little sentence, is most people tend to underestimate cross-cultural negotiations and most people tend to overestimate at the same time cross-cultural negotiations. So how can we have this what seem a seemingly paradoxical situation? Let me start with the underestimating part. People come to me normally and ask, so what ask you, how do I negotiate with the Chinese? Very hot question right now. And I say, which Chinese exactly do you want to talk to? Do you want to talk to the Chinese from Beijing or Shanghai? The one that came from the the countryside and moved to a city or the one who was born and raised in a city? A young one or an older one? Right? Uh, the one who left to study abroad and came back or one who always lived here. So there are so many Chinese and by the way we know that there are a lot of Chinese out there that it becomes really hard because they all will have what? Different cultures beyond just being Chinese and that's the underestimation. People tend to only look at national culture when they go into international negotiations and they try to they, they try to, to look into that but they then don't want they don't look what? That there is also uh, educational culture, a uh, race culture, uh, a gender culture, a religious culture, right? And all of these will also impact the way people behave and that's all cross-cultural. Which then means what? We are underestimating the role of culture because we're only looking at the national one. And we need to, as negotiators, to also try to understand all of the others. Why? Because they're going to help us understand how the person thinks and communicates. And therefore, I'll be able to negotiate and persuade that person better. From the yeah. overestimation part, that's um, when perhaps you may be negotiating with somebody from the similar sort of background, that you may be making certain assumptions uh, about that person's stance when those assumptions may not be correct. Absolutely. And that's a mistake that many people fall into, uh, to assume too much because they perceive the, the national culture is there. And then they underestimate the risk. Right? So for example, sometimes I will tell people, and maybe I'll be making a little bit of an exaggeration here, but just to make a point, which is sometimes I would much rather negotiate with an older woman, um, Muslim, who lives in the countryside of Mongolia, than maybe with a Catholic, middle-aged, lawyer background uh, male from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, where I come from. Right? Why? Because with that second person, they might, we might feel like we're so alike that we'll make so many assumptions of what we should know and understand from one another as well that we're going to many times run the risk of overestimating that proximity, right? And in overestimating that proximity, we might not mention some of the risks or opportunities that we perceive and therefore running the risk of either losing money or not making as much as we could. Whereas with someone who I see so different from me, I'm going to be so extra careful through the negotiation and making sure I, I, I dot all the I's and, and, and cross all the T's that I actually will run less of that risk. Right? So we also have to be aware of that, uh, the, the visual proximity and how that might actually fool us into thinking what is culture, what's not, and the assumption risk behind it. But given that there are so many different people from different backgrounds, mm -hmm. I mean, how can you overcome this? Well, basically then, the first assumption you should have is that every negotiation is a cross-cultural exercise. Right? So that's the short answer. Right? Every negotiation? Every negotiation. You're negotiating with your wife, with your husband, that's a cross-culture, it's a different gender. And different genders see things differently and they talk about things differently. You're talking to your kids. Many people come to me and say, how do I negotiate with my kids? Well, it's a different age. It's different. It's a different culture. They see the world. They like different kinds of music. They like different kinds of food. They like to do different kinds of things. That's as different a culture as it might get. And yet, they are your own blood. So you have to understand how do they think differently because of that cultural distance. How do they behave differently? How do they think? How do they speak differently? So that I can what? I can find the right arguments to go into their mind and help them see the world as I see it. And in helping them do that, they'll probably be a little closer to seeing and agreeing to what I want them to see and agree.
But um, just to go to um, negotiations within a company, mm -hmm. um, I've seen personally in, say, in Hong Kong yeah. that um, there's a different style, a different approach to negotiations than you would have in the West, where the West might be more direct. In Asia, you can skirt around the subject for, say, 20 minutes before you get on to the, the key item. And here we, we might then flip on to the overestimation side, right? People then, when they ne deal with someone who's that different, what they will probably do many times is blame everything that goes wrong or difficult on national culture. But maybe you're just dealing with a very shy person from Hong Kong who is not very forthcoming in a relationship. It will just say, because I don't know that person so well, it's just so easy to attach it to the flag and say, oh, because they're Chinese and, and they're Asians, of course they're not as forthcoming, for example. When it might not be the case, right? There might be some very extrovert people from Hong Kong, and I'm sure there are, right? On the other hand then, there will be some, uh, those other cultures, again, the, 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 the race, the gender, the ethnicity, the, 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 the religion, the age, all of those will impact. And, and the negotiator should be looking to the whole spectrum. However, it is true, as you're putting forward, that if you come from a different national culture, there's a higher likelihood that you're going to have some different rituals, cultural rituals. And how we build relationship, as you re refer to yourself, or how we communicate specifically, has to be done differently. So for example, if we go into a place like the Middle East, you would expect people to spend a fair amount of time talking about themselves and trying to understand one another, building more of a stronger relationship before they go into the substance of the deal itself. right? Maybe in the US or Scandinavia, people are going to jump further straight into the business, just having a small introduction, maybe talk about the weather and things like that, and boom, go straight into it. So the rituals are different. But sometimes the order in which you do things, or how you, or, or the reason why you do things, or what should or should not be done, will be underlyingly the same. Right? The same based on what? On two main negotiation cultures that we find out there. But just to um, take, say, the example of the Japanese culture, okay. you, you do see a lot of rituals attached to that sort of negotiating uh, process. Absolutely. So for example, just to go back to the relationship building phase, which is one that is very different, right? Sometimes if you want to create a, a long-lasting relationship in Japan with a business partner, which will generate hopefully a lot of value for you in the future, you might need to spend sometimes a year before you can even start talking about business just really getting to know one another, this is extremely important. You spend one year trying to build a relationship with someone in the US, they're going to get tired of you, they're going to move on to someone who actually will start talking money faster. So again, the ritual is different. But both of them will do in that investment on relationship to the level that their rituals require. Right? For example, communication or the process in which people deal with one another is another very important dimension in which rituals will impact tremendously. For example, in Japan, you don't say no directly in many instances. You have to find a more indirect way to let the other person know, understand, that I don't want to do something. Right? Now, the same principle will apply to the Japanese or, or, or another culture in which, as I try to indirectly tell you no, I still want that no to be as clear in your mind as I can possibly convey it. Just the form in doing that will be different. Is it possible to get uh, somebody to coach you in Absolutely. terms of dealing with a particular culture? Absolutely. So here's where I would make the two distinctions. If you want to become a better negotiator, period, then, then a negotiation training or coach will help you, right? And it will help you to give you all the underlying things you should be worrying about to be get, being successful in a negotiation. If you want to have a little polishing on those rituals, then a, a cultural coach might actually be more relevant because they will be more understanding of, so how are relationships actually built in the workplace? In a place like Japan, Korea, China, if you're coming from uh, Europe or the US, for example, right? Or vice versa, right? Um, how do we actually communicate when there is a difference in power? How does that normally go? Or when we're coordinate, how are you supposed to propose an idea? How is the decision making made so that I can respect if you need to consult with other people or if I expect you already to decide to me on the spot? So those sensitivities, I would actually much rather have someone from that country helping me understand what normally goes on. Especially someone who can be what? A bi-national experienced person. Someone who lived in that country that you're going for, but also has some experience for your own, so that they can do the translation as accurately as possible. So when it comes down to it, do you basically then look at the, the person you're negotiating with as either friend or foe? Somebody you, you, you can work with, or somebody who's going to work against you? Well, I start with the assumption, maybe, of 
at the very get-go of zero. I don't know. And why does that help me? That helps me to approach you from a learning perspective. I'll start to try to gather and ask and learn as fast as I can about you to know if you are friend or foe. Right? So by coming with cultural assumptions, they are always foe or they're always friend, that's wrong because that individual in front of you might be neither. Right? Or might be both, depending on how you approach them. If I already approach as foe, they will reciprocate. If I already approach as friend, they might reciprocate as well. So sometimes the power is with me in defining what the other one will do. Therefore, I prefer to come in and start learning, gauging as carefully as I can. Are you in one block? Are you in the other block? Or you're the kind of person who will work with me depending on where I go. And then as soon as I start getting some of that learning, I'll start to proactively then send the messages off, I would much rather work with you on hopefully the friend block so that we can do more together than just fight, for example. So you're going through a period process of um, exploration with the person. Absolutely. And then presumably you um, adjust your own uh, stance accordingly. The adjustment part, um, I like to recommend to people to be more proactive in that, right? Because if you adjust too much, you end up getting out of what? Your comfort zone. You start getting into their home turf. And that can become a, a dangerous play because you're, you're, you're outside of your, your area of reach um, and your, of your best behavior and expertise and decision making. So I like to understand what's going on. I want to learn so that when I start driving the process, I know how to better lead you. But it's not so much for me to follow because the other person might not know how to lead. So hopefully a person with good negotiation training can lead, but they need to understand what kind of language should I be talking. Because if I go to Brazil, I need to speak Portuguese to lead. If I go to China, I need to speak Chinese. So it's not that I'm going to change my leadership style necessarily, but I'm going to change the way I convey it to people. So what are the steps then that you would recommend that people should take when dealing with cross-cultural negotiations? Um, whew, that's, uh, so, so there's the underestimation, overestimation. That's more of an internal thinking process. The other one is to remember that to learn, right? If every experience is a cross-cultural experience, there will always be assumptions, there will always be differences that you need to gather as you go through the process. And you need to understand the person in front of you. Because if you get right what 99.9% .9 of the Chinese do, but not the person in front of you, you failed. So you need to really understand that one person there. Then the other thing you, you want to do is, in trying to understand, so how much we adapt or adjust to one another, to go back to what you said. And after you do that exploration exercise and you start learning more who that person is, then if you have the chance, either by gathering intelligence early on or by separating the meeting and things like that, if you're talking more of a long-term thing, for example, sit down and really prepare. And that's where the cultural coach can be quite helpful or a negotiation to also help you distinguish what? In terms of negotiation, as I mentioned earlier, there are only two cultures. There's the competitive culture and there's a the collaborative culture, as you mentioned, friend or foe in a way, right? And that can come out with all sorts of what? Different codings, but those are just the rituals. So if you understand the underlying culture of negotiation that that person is following, it becomes much easier then with that little coding to move forward and that learning process becomes much faster, which means you can prepare much earlier and much faster and much better. Exploration learning, preparation, and then what? Adjusting. Adjusting in the sense of what I mentioned before, not completely giving up your wave towards the other. Maybe also not requiring them to do that because it might get them too uncomfortable. Some people say, so should we meet in the middle? It's a way, but then both of us feel half uncomfortable. So many people will say, let's try to do a third way. Let's try to build a process that works for both of us considering who we are. And that's kind of a win-win situation. And that it? hopefully will lead to a win-win. Because I'm not trying to play a, a game on you. You're not trying to play your game on me. We're not trying to play a game which is kind of half and half, which is not systematic, which means it might be two odd halves together, right? We try to build a system that works for both of us considering what? What are the underlying principles that really matter here and not just the rituals? And we create our own rituals. Now, that might take time, right? And I'll, I'll give you that any day. But if you're talking about a long-term relationship or a big value creation exercise, right, or something that just matters a lot to you, then that's the, at least the right way to do it. It might be a little harder, it might take a little bit more time, but you run much less risks, or you're much more certain to be successful. And reduce the uh, risk of any misunderstanding. That's for sure, that's for sure. Horatio, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it.